I have a real heaviness with this message this morning. I've been over here since early this morning. I've been praying. I've been feeling some different things, both in my spirit. And I was sent an email from someone that I want to share at the end of the message. Um, I have been sent... I'm at the 40,000 range of emails right now in the last two weeks. I've had emails sent to me from every state in the union. I've had emails sent to me from over 60, 65 countries. I've had phone calls from about 15 different nations. I've talked to a lot of people in, in the prophetic world. I had no idea what we were going to call. Sidney Jacobs called me one day after meeting my, after, you know, after my phone number from uh, um, our, our district superintendent. And I'm seeing one major thing in, in all the, the emails and the letters and the dreams that I'm, that I'm hearing about, and that is this, that we sense the same thing that I have sensed in the dream that I shared. And I'm hearing from people all over the nation that are saying, we feel that something big is coming. We feel something harsh is coming. We feel, we feel that something strong is coming. I've heard that thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of times, and I'm not making this up. I'm hearing it on Messenger, and then this morning a, a, a lady has sent me, I'm just going to say her name is uh, Celia. I don't want to put her name out there. I, I did send a message to her to say, hey, can I, is it okay if I share this? She's not going to back with me, but I need to share part of the dream. So a lady named Celia sent me an email that I'll share at the end. But I also want you to understand that uh, I'm having a lot of people ask me you know, to talk and, and a lot about the dreams and the situation, the thing with that, my interpretation of it, or, or what I said how, how, how I said, how I said to respond to it. I'm not going to try to incorporate those things in every message that I preach. But I'm bringing the, the email that, that this lady sent to me just this morning from wherever she is at. Does it qualify for both not the dream I have, but also the message that I'm preaching this morning? So read with me. Peter says, Therefore I will always be ready to remind you of these things. Even though you already know them. It's not about the things that if you add uh, you know, um, all the things to the first part. Uh, these qualities, knowledge, self-control, uh, perseverance, godliness, brotherly kindness, love. As he said, if you, if you have these qualities that work in your life, you'll not be, you'll not be empty-handed. You'll have all that you need to live for Christ. Although you already know them and have been established in the truth which is present with you, I consider it right as long as I am in this earthly dwelling to stir you up by way of reminder, knowing that the laying aside of my earthly dwelling is imminent, as also our Lord Jesus Christ made clear to me, and I will also be diligent that at any time after my departure you will be able to call these things to mind. For we did not follow cleverly, cleverly devised tales when we made known to you the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. But we were eyewitnesses to His majesty. Even when He received honor and glory from God the Father, such as an utterance as this was made to Him by the majestic glory, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. And we ourselves heard this utterance made from heaven when we were with Him on the holy mountain. So there's some things that we have firsthand. I want you to know this. We're responsible for what we do with what we know. Church, we're responsible for what we do with what we know. Both from the Word, what our mamas told us. Or our dads poured into us as we were being raised. We're responsible for it. We can't get to heaven and say, well, God, you know, my, my pastor never preached about that particular subject matter in a Sunday morning. God's going to say, you could have read it yourself. It's about taking what we know, like going into all the world. I've had people say, well, we go into all the world parts for missionaries only. Uh, no, it's not. Every disciple is instructed to go into all the world. If you can't go, if you can't send, you pray. You provide the finances so they can get there. We're responsible for what we do what we know. And Peter is saying to them, God has expectations of us daily. Every one of us here knows that to be a Christian requires a couple of things. First of all, a knowledge of who He is. That means we've got to be in the book. We've got to be, I've got to have a nose there, we've got to be reading, we've got to be studying, we've got to be praying, we've got to be meditating on the Word of God, as David talked about. We have to have a prayer life. We have to have communication with Him. We need to have an understanding of what the body of Christ looks like, how it functions, how it works. And we need to be a part of the body of Christ. Yes. We have to be connected. We're part of the branches. We're part of that vine. 
We have to work together to see it. And the thing is, it's an ever-present truth that never changes. The principles of God's Word that applied 3,000 years ago, or 4,000 years ago in Egypt, still apply today. Murder is still wrong. Some things we can't change no matter what we deal with it. Or how we dress it, no matter how much of a cultural spin we put on it. There are two, still two sexes, male and female, period. That's it. But yet if we let anything become fluid, guess what we do? We change the whole definition of it. We erase it and we put something else on top of it. And anybody that wants to be a binary number, go for it. What's he talking about? There are people whose identity is now an X. Or a 111. Or a 1010. Because we have this, this, this maddening idea that there's no such thing as, as, as men or women anymore. No such thing as, 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 as a girl or a boy. So what happened? Somebody changed the definitions of what happened. See, the Word of God has a certain standards we have to, have, to, have to abide by and follow at all given times. Yes. And Peter's trying to say, look, one day I'm going to be gone, folks, and when I'm gone, I need you to remember the things I've taught you and preached to you and told you. Parents, when you think about something, what are you teaching your kids and your grandkids? What are you pouring into them? What are you investing in them? What are you saying to them about the things in the culture around us and the world in which we live? There was, there was a bunch of commercials back when I was a youth pastor in the 90s. And it showed some guy like in, a, in a leather jacket. And he, and he was saying, you know, if you don't talk to your kids about sex, I will. And guess what happened in our world? A lot of parents in the church were like, that's something we can't talk about. I've had people leave this church because I was going to do a sexual sin series. And I was told by someone sitting right over there in that chair that's empty in front of Sylvia. They said, you're not supposed to preach about that stuff in church. And I'm leaving. I haven't seen her since. No one told me I was supposed to preach about sex in the church. It's in the Bible. The Song of Solomon's pretty, you know. That's not just a romantic book there, I'm telling you. But we with this idea, well, we can't talk about this. We can't talk about that. Don't mention anything political. You already know what I say about stuff. The Paul was saying, or Peter was saying, I want you to know, after I'm gone, you need to be able to bring these things back to your mind. What's that mean? It means they heard Peter. They listened to Peter. They took, they took stake in what Peter had said, and they, they filed away themselves in their own hearts and minds. Peter, he's living, but he's conscious he's about to go the way of, the, the way of, the, the, the way of death. He says, knowing that the land inside of my earthly dwelling is imminent. Imminent. We're waiting the imminent return of Jesus, aren't we? We know He's coming back soon. So here He is. And Peter is saying, look, I know I'm going to die. So I've got to get all this information out to you. And I need you to make sure you get it into your head and into your heart. And you begin to live it out. And you pass it on to somebody else. You share it. The depository of scriptural knowledge in our world today is not just in books. It's in the hearts and lives and minds of people who sit in our churches today. You understand what it means, what it looks like, what it sounds like, how it should be lived out practically every single day. And we are responsible to share those experiences and the knowledge of the Word of God that we have with the next generation up and coming. Because if we don't, we're going to be held accountable for that. Focus on us. Look, 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 look what Peter is saying. I need you to remember what I said. I need you to remember. And I will also be diligent any time after my departure, you'll be able to recall these things to mind. He basically said, I've done everything in my life to make sure that when I'm gone, you know enough about the epistles, you know enough about the gospels, you know enough about how to live by the word that you can do it on your own. But we raise our kids that way. And we share with our kids enough knowledge that they can make it on their own where they're going. When things that they're facing and dealing with. You see, he wants them to remember that even after he is gone, after he is gone, those things are important. Something I say at every funeral I do, and usually it's, it's at the graveside service, I will say, folks, make sure you keep talking about this loved one, the loved one that you just buried. Keep telling the stories about them, keep telling those, those jokes you got so tired of hearing that they told. 
keep laughing about them, keep their memory alive. Why? Because if you stop talking about them, they get forgotten. And the values and the kind of people they were and the things they did are forgotten. And those stories are not passed on to generation to generation and long after that. You've heard me say this to the folks at Color Church Home. My grandma would tell me a story about my great, 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 great grandfather who used to blow up our house with dynamite and worked on the railroads. Crazy man, and I got it honestly in my family line, okay? Now my grandma never met him, right? But somebody passed those stories down. And I remember sitting on my grandpa's leg at two or three years old and my grandma telling me, now you had a family member that was crazy. And she said just like that. And they wonder why I like fireworks so much as a kid. But, but basically the story was passed down and told to me because somebody kept sharing it. There were things about your life that you shared on and, on and on and on and on for generations to come. You and I have a responsibility to keep the gospel going with our kids and our grandkids and our great grandkids because long after we're gone, they still have to be talking about how we live for the Lord and how we serve Him. The kind of example that we have, the kind of heritage that we left behind for them. You see, and also he says Peter was a witness of Jesus himself. He saw the miracles. Peter was there when Lazarus rose from the dead and walked out with the sheep, the cloth, the death traps all around him. Peter heard Bartimaeus say, Jesus, now son of David, have mercy on me. Peter got to see Zacchaeus climb the tree. Peter got to see with his hands just unfurled. Jesus, Peter got to see Jesus cast spirits out of kids. Little kids were throwing themselves in the fire. Jesus, or Peter got to see demons flee when Jesus said, and when the boat was rocking, the storms all over the place, and Jesus is asleep. Who better than a fisherman to wake Peter up? Or wake Jesus up? You ever think about that? I don't think it was Bartholomew. I don't think the storm was that bad. Or Philip. I think James and John and Peter said, Jesus, get up! We've been on these waters like this. It's crazy. We've got to do something now. Wake up! You think Jesus woke up in a panic? Oh, God! Oh, my goodness! Oh, my goodness! God, Father, you got to do something now! He wasn't panicked. I see him getting up and straighten himself up. Hey, guys, watch this. Peace, be still. Peter was there and got to see it. Peter got to see nature controlled by Jesus. Peter got to see healings that were miraculous. Peter got to see demons cast out. Peter got to see people raised from the dead. First hand witness, first hand knowledge. He was there and saw it. Right up front, close to personal. And this is his story. This is his life. We're not talking about somebody who got a second hand from that third cousin, you know, that, that, that first cousin's married wife on the, on the side who got divorced here and there, and, and then, you know, yeah, it's always go. These guys were there, they saw it firsthand, up close and personal. He was there when he heard the father's voice that said, This is my beloved son, in whom I am well. He heard the voice. He heard the voice of the Father. There's 12 men, they heard the voice of the Father speak this. Now I wonder sometimes, in our day and age, we would think, let's, see, let's, see, let's, let's, let's bring Jesus and the disciples into 2020. And you're walking with Jesus in Walmart. Somebody goes to buy one of those motorized carts. And you can tell they've got scoliosis. Somebody says, hey, Jesus is in the bread aisle! Pull in all these people all around Jesus. And between the wheat bread and the white bread, you can't see him. And she's pushing that cart to get through and she's running over people's feet. But hey, what are you doing? Why stop that? Get back. So she, she pushes through. Runs over James and John's foot. Reaches out and touches Jesus. And suddenly he and stands up. Now would that not be cool? 
How many other people noticed you got healed in that store? You ever look at that passage? Does it say the crowd was in great awe of what they just seen? Who did it matter to the most that she got healed? Okay, Jesus, we know you sent this message, but what did it mean? Can you, can, you, can, you, can you involve us in this story and tell us what does this mean? See, Peter was there. Peter was there. Peter's trying to say, he's told these folks, here's what you need to have in your life to be a stronger believer, a stronger Christian. Here's what you need to never stumble or fail. And I'm, and I'm saying it because I saw, I heard, I saw all these things. I know what I'm talking about. In other words, he's qualifying what he's writing. He's qualifying what he's saying. He wants you to know that he was there. It's not just some made-up thing. We have it firsthand from the witness in solid confidence of what we have. Let's keep reading in verse 19 to 21. So we have the prophetic word made more sure to which you do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star arises in your hearts. But know this first of all that no prophecy of Scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever made by an act of human will, but men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. And part of the reason he's talking about this stuff here now is because chapter 2 deals with false prophets and the things going on in, in a crazy, crazy world. But here's the assurance that we have, first of all. Did you know there are more copies of the New Testament than Shakespeare and Homer's Iliad? If you put all of the Shakespeare's works together... All the copies of Shakespeare's works together. There are more copies of the New Testament than of those books, those letters. Several years ago, I was able to actually see the Dead Sea Scrolls at the Science and Technology Museum in Chicago, Illinois. Want to see it? And it was wonderful to see these things under these, these special lights because they confirmed the Dead Sea Scrolls, confirmed that what we have in Scripture today is accurate and authoritative right. and right. Think about a bunch of monks sitting in a basement writing and writing and writing and writing and writing. Who took it as the Word of God being very, very careful to make sure every jot, every tittle, every, every period, every comma, and all those things, every word was written as it was because they realized it is the Word of God. And the care and the accuracy that they had in doing that. Peter's trying to say, not only were we witnesses of these things, you can trust what we say because the Word of God said these things that we saw were going to happen. The miracles, the healing, and the things like that. And those prophecies from God's Word stand out in history. For their accuracy and their fulfillment. Right now we know this. One third of the Word is prophecy. Over 300 verses specifically have been fulfilled so far. And I believe we're, we're about to see some major things happen from the book of Revelation. Some things from Daniel that we're beginning to see happen in, in, our, in, our, in our nation, around the world, uh, and in governments and political systems. Uh, we see a whole lot of transition and things going on at the moment. Paul said in the last days, perilous times will come. Perilous times. What is peril? Peril is not just, you know, hey, the mall's closed for a week. Peril is, the world is falling apart, things are changing, things are shifting. There's sickness, there's illness. Okay, just in the last eight weeks, let me tell you what's happening. You have a locust plague in Argentina, heading north of Brazil and Venezuela. You've had a locust plague in Saudi Arabia and Yemen. And you've had a locust plague in China. All about the same time that most of the plants were, the seeds were planted, okay? Did you, are you aware they tested a squirrel for bubonic plague in Colorado? Now, I don't know what you have to do as a squirrel to get tested for plague, okay? I know prairie dogs have that from time. I don't know what the squirrel was doing. Okay, I've seen rabid animals. I don't know if some guy said, Honey, I just saw a squirrel outside. He's got to have the plague of what he was doing. You know. I don't know if he was holding up a political sign or what, but nonetheless, they said, This thing, they, it's got plague. We have rabbit Ebola in this country. Rabbit Ebola. You know what Ebola is? It's an African disease that liquefies your organs and it comes out in blood. Rabbit Ebola! They're looking for a whole brand new phase, and some of you guys don't like this, of blue tongue disease with deer this year. Anybody notice that bees were dying out at an incredible rate in a lot of places, including here locally? 
Perfect storm. Tell me how long you think the banks can last. I mean, this is just beyond honest with some things. How long can the banks last? How long can our Federal Reserve last with all things going on financially in our country? You got India and China like this. If you watch the news, you realize that Turkey's been threatening Greece for the last several months. Tisha B'Av. Anyone know what that is? Tisha B'Av. It's the memorial of when the temple was destroyed. It's coming after July 30th. If you read the Jerusalem Post, you're going to find something. There's been a lot of talk about annexing a certain part of Israel, the West Bank, which will probably cause a huge fight. The problem is talking about making some decisions on this and making them public. How explosive is Israel right now? How explosive is Jerusalem? And how long has Israel been without its capital recognized as Jerusalem, even by this country? I think one of the best things President Trump did was to establish our embassy in Jerusalem. Amen. Confirming it as Israel's capital. And regardless of how you feel about President Trump, that took a lot of guts. I think King Cyrus would have been proud of President Trump. In all reality, if you know your history, you know where I'm coming from. The point is this. We're beginning to see things happen in our world which are coming right out of the prophetic. And I want to remind you of one thing. In Matthew, when Jesus said, and because, of the law, because of lawlessness, the love of many will grow cold. Think about that verse and how it's translated, how it comes out. Because of lawlessness. When there's lawlessness, you think of crime, you think of violence, you think of persecution, opposition, maybe. I'll get it that way. Because how can lawlessness cause a great falling away? Maybe because persecution comes with it. And when persecution comes, we're about to find out who in the church is really living their life for Christ. Yeah. Amen. And I'm not basing this on dreams I'm having, but I'm basing this on the Word of God. We see things happen. We see nations crumbling and falling apart. We, see, we have seen Brexit. We have seen the European Union. We have seen it go from 10 stars to, to, to 14 or 18 or 21, even 30. And now we see all of those, those things falling apart in England and over the European Union. Venezuela has become a cesspool. Where 20 years ago was a prosperous, thriving nation where people love living there. Think about where you'd go if you're not, if, if you were to leave this country, where would you go? <laughs> it's going to get hot there too. But the point is, we see things in the scripture starting to happen, starting to get hot. We see these things that are coming, and we have to understand where we are in this, in this situation. Men called by God spoke what he shared with them. There were prophets of old. Prophets of old. Men like Joel, Habakkuk, Zechariah, Zephaniah, Malachi, Jonah. Men who heard the word of God and they spoke it out. They spoke it out because God showed them. And I'm thankful that in the, at the end of most of those books, there was always that promise, if you return to me, I'll be there to take you back. There was always consequences, though. Because even if you return, you still have to deal with the residue of what you've done to get yourself in that place to begin seeing the consequences. They're tearing down statues. Most of them don't even know what those statues represent. Because the people tearing them down have never studied history. Right. Probably could not pass a test on history on who the statue belongs to. And so we have people who are abolitionists. We have people who, who fought against slavery. And those statues have been torn down or spray painted. That makes me so mad. If they would just read something. Yeah. But yet what does history do? History teaches us where people and nations have failed. Have we failed as a nation? Plenty of times. Plenty of times. Have you failed as a human being? As a husband, as a wife, as a parent, as a child? Of course we have. Why? Because we're human. But I like to know what history says has, has happened. So not just so we don't repeat it, but because history helps us know where we've been and what we are. Here's what it really comes down to. He says, we do not believe fables, we do not believe myths, we do not believe fairy tales, we do not believe figments of somebody's imagination. Every single disciple that walked with Jesus, served him, ate the bread and the drank the cup at the Last Supper, every single one of them was killed, except John. And John was boiled alive in oil and then put on a rocky place. 
spend the rest of his life. Don't you understand something? If, you, if your body was boiled alive in oil, what would it do to the pores of your skin? So how do you sweat? You want to know how painful John the Revelator's life was? Life was and yet, he was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. Not complaining about his condition. Not concerned about how hot he was or how awful the condition. He just said, Lord, I'm in the, he was in the Spirit on the Lord's day and the Lord spoke to him. Peter's trying to remind us that they saw this firsthand. They didn't write down a fairy tale. They didn't hear it from somebody else. They saw it firsthand. And therefore, we can believe it and trust it. So we've got a real Savior. We've got a real witness. We've got a real truth. And literally, we have this. A real opportunity to do something for the Lord. And because we have the gospel, because we have the word of God, I've got to say something very harsh and very firm. The spiritual life that you have right now is not going to be enough for what's coming. I need you to hear me. I need you to hear me. I need you to hear me. I'm going to read an email that I got from, once again, her name is uh, Celia. She sent this to me this morning. She said, I had a vision of my church in the month of March, early March, had me in a deep prayer immediately when I saw it. I was playing piano and singing at the beginning of service over my vision, and then over my vision came a scene. I was standing looking out over the congregation that was no longer my church. I was viewing, a, I saw a barren land, it was dry land, cracked, dusty, as far deep and as wide as my vision could go. Over the horizon line, in the distance in front of me, I heard noise. I heard noise so loud I wanted to cover my ears, but because I was, I was praying, I was playing the piano, I could not. Over the horizon came figures, and as they came closer, I could make out what they were. Demons of all sizes and shapes. I have not seen before. As far as the horizon stretched from east to west, they were coming, fists in the air, running as hard and as fast as they could, screaming and making unearthly sounds, battle cries. There were no, there were no armor, but they were fierce and thirsty for blood. I remember specifically that their teeth, and, and in one, on one specific beast, who seemed to be the leader in charge, who was probably ten feet tall, shaped like a gorilla, but not a man, muscles upon muscles, sharp fangs like teeth dripping with saliva, eyes black as night, and, and evil to, as can be colored a putrid green shade. As they ran towards me, I noticed the horde was never ending. It seemed stretching as far back as I could see, stretching deep as I could see and wide as I could see. I asked him what he was showing me, and he said, prepare yourself, prepare the church, persecution is here. Now let me tell you something else. Let me just, I'm just going to count right now. I just counted 24 new emails I've got since church started. About the dream. Let me tell you, I've had thousands of emails like that telling me dreams that other people are having. I've had over 500 printed dreams that people have sent me in my office right now. People are having dreams about persecution, all these things that are coming. You know what I think? I wasn't the only one having dreams like this. think Rome went public with their persecution? Have they thrown other people to the lions? Anybody know the answer to that? They would throw people from time to time who weren't Christians to the lions. But Rome loved throwing Christians Estimates are as many as 41,000 Christians were fed to the lions. They would keep them underneath the, the Colosseum floor. They would bring them up sometimes 10 to 20 at a time. They especially loved bringing up families with kids. It brought people into the Colosseum. And even though Rome was going broke, bread and service, you ever heard that term? We can entertain the people, we'll feed the, the, the people and the, the bystanders watching, we'll feed them and we'll give them entertainment and they'll leave. They won't worry about what the senators are doing in Rome. Do you realize that more centurion guards and more Roman soldiers got saved because they fed people to the lions? Who did not run, who did not scream, who, who, most of the people, in Roman's history will tell you this, most of the Christians they had up there did not say, oh, wait, wait, I'm not a Christian, I, I, no, no, you got the wrong person, I, I'm not, I, I don't follow Jesus. They never saw that happen. If what they saw were people with convictions who said, I'm not going to kneel my knee to you or to any Caesar. 
I'm a follower of Jesus. That's the kind of persecution that's coming for us. Don't just take my word. Like, like, like I told you, I've had thousands, I mean thousands of emails like that. Thousands of them. People saying, we feel like persecution is coming. We feel like big things are coming. The dream that I had resonates in our hearts and our minds and our spirits. Someone from a news agency got a hold of this last week and said they estimate that 250 million people have seen that video. Only way that happens is the sovereign hand of God. Heaven. Heaven. You folks know me. You know where I live. You know what I'm doing. Someone's actually starting a website. It's going to be a countdown to December 1st for me to apologize for everything I said. Someone tried to fake an Instagram, you know, sort of fake Instagram account last week on me. And allowed Hannah, my daughter, to follow it. Which is kind of wild. Within 25 minutes, the whole thing was shut down. Which I was thankful. What are we going to do when things really get tough? See, Peter's trying to tell us that the prophetic word we had confirms that this book that we have is real, it's true, it's accurate. That this book we have, it matters. Yes. And I'm just going to say it this way, and I don't mean to be, I'm not being rude or mean. Look, if, you're, if your devotional life, all of it is about that little one page, three paragraph, and one verse you read every morning, that's not going to cut it when persecution comes. That's not that's the kind of devotional life that's not going to change the church or make a difference in the world, make a difference where you work. It's not going to make a difference in the people you're around. Because God's going to start, he's, he's asking the church to come into account. He's asking the church basically to say this, get a backbone. Be ready for what's coming. Brace yourself, brace yourself, brace yourself. Prepare, prepare, prepare. If you do a little survey of all, the, all the, some of the comments about the video that I put on, you're going to hear from thousands of people who are saying they've been feeling, sensing, hearing the same thing for a long time. I believe some of those people. And I purposely not listen to a lot of the stuff that's being said about me because I, I, Joe Gerner sent me a message. He said, Pastor Dan, here's a quote. When people throw bricks at you, make sure you build something good with it. I've been doing my best to do that. But... Folks, you've got to get your spiritual life on track where it needs to be. You need to do it now. You look, don't wait until the persecution happens. If, 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 if the weatherman comes on and says, okay, Brooksville, Kentucky, uh, today's going to be very, very hot. We've got low air, low, we've got the highs and lows coming in, and there's a good chance that <coughs> by evening we can see some tor tornado like weather. Okay, so you go home and you say, yeah, should we get the, 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 the weather radio out? Nah, you know, we. we We've never really seen one. It's always south here. It's always near Nashville or Tennessee. It's lighter areas. We've got the ridges around here that'll protect us. How long ago was it they had the big tornado came through? Years ago? Kevin, how long ago was it? 73. 73. So we're coming up on what? Almost 50 years since you had a big tornado come through. Okay? What if at 6 o'clock tonight, tonight, that night, the guy comes back and says, okay, well, folks, look. We've had serious wind damage in Glasgow. This thing is coming towards Burksville. Uh, you might want to you know, try to find a place to get prepared. If you have a basement, get in the basement, do something. Okay? And you say, eh, we got the bridges to protect us. At 8 o'clock, the guy comes back on and says, you need to be in a shelter right now. It's on top of you. Where's the best place to be? The best place to be is to heat the morning you get the first. Why is God warning the church about it? Why is He telling us persecution is coming? Just so we can just, you know, sit back on our haunches and nothing? No. He's trying to say, look, there's some hard times coming. And the easiest people who will be out the doors and that day will be the ones who never really had a solid relationship with the Lord, who maybe came to church all their lives and never served Him. And folks, look, people sit in our churches all of their lives and never accept Christ. Never deal with the doctor. Never have, those, never have any commitment to who Jesus is. They just kind of sit there. Jesus said in Matthew 7, there's a real narrow gate that goes through the A real narrow gate. Not the broad, wide road where you can bring all your baggage and all your luggage and all your sin and all those things. Jesus is saying you've got to deal with the sin, you've got to address the issues, and you've got to get back to where you need to be because there's something coming in the church that's going to light this thing up. 
And if you're not ready, it's going to blow you over. When you brace yourself, you put your right foot back and you lean into whatever's coming. Why? So you won't get knocked over. Church, what's your spiritual life look like? Peter said, we saw these things, we saw them firsthand. And I'm telling you these things to remind you that when hard times come, you can believe what we said because it's true. Just like the prophets told us certain things would happen, certain things would come. The Word of God prophesied that Israel would become a nation. And some of you were alive when that happened. Some of you are watching what's happening in the scripture with the nations around us and you're seeing those things come together and you're saying, wow, we're sick. I really believe it's one of the most exciting times in the history of the world to live. We get to see how those things come out. We're about to find out just how solid and stable our theology was. We're about to find out if we're right about the rapture, not right about the rapture. All we need to be right about is ready when Jesus comes, period. I've had more, more people argue about well, the rapture will take place here and then. And I've got dates and people tell me, this is going to happen, that's going to happen. All that matters is that we're ready when Jesus comes. Amen. Kids, you come back to the piano for just a few moments and get in play. So if I want to encourage you today to examine your spiritual life right now. Bow your heads, close your eyes, and ask the Lord where you stand, how you're doing. Ask the Lord to, to assess you. Don't be afraid to say, God, where am I failing miserably? God, where have where, where my, where my thoughts become loose? Where has my language become loose? Where has my heart or my attitude become loose? Ask the Lord to assess your spiritual life, your time in the Word, your prayer life, the discipline, the spiritual disciplines in your life. How you doing with self-control? How you doing with holding your tongue? How you doing with forgiveness? How are you doing with the things that are necessary for us to get to heaven? Because the Lord's trying to warn us and teach us and show us that there's some hard times coming. And if you don't have a deep root, you're going to get blown over. Jesus told the story of the two houses, the two foundations. One guy built on sand, the storm came and blew it away. But the house built on rock had a storm come against the two folks. And I guarantee there was some shingles missing. And maybe some windows broke out. But the house stood because it was built on a strong, solid foundation. So how's your foundation today? How is it? Are you ready for the storms that are coming? Are you ready to, to face in it and face head on the stuff that's going to be happening and coming your way? Are you ready to keep your life with Christ? Physically, literally, in the flesh. Parts of our nation are going through some Catholic churches and beheading the statues of Jesus. Some parts of our nation are harassing people walking in their churches. The videos are out there. Some parts of our nation are seeing spray painting on churches. <coughs> Destroying stained glass. Now I'm not just talking about historic churches. I'm talking about storefronts. And every kind of church you can imagine. It's coming. It's coming. It's almost like a crystal knot. Not a broken glass for Christians in this country. Those things are coming. Are you ready? Are you ready spiritually for what's about to happen? Are you ready spiritually for what's coming? And if you're here and you know, Pastor, I need to deal with, I need to get some things in my spiritual life right. I need my walk with the Lord right. You may just need to repent. That's a good start for Christians because we need to repent of things in our lives. I want you to come to the altar just right now. Just get up and come. Get here as fast as you can. Begin to pray, ask, confess those sins to the Lord. Begin to confess those things that need to go. Begin to confess those things you're struggling with and you're dealing with. And don't wait. Don't wait a week. Don't wait a month. Don't wait a day. Get your life right with the Lord. Because He's coming. And He's telling the church He's coming. He's telling the church persecution is coming. And if we ignore it, if we ignore it, it's on us. It's on us. So would you come and pray? Would you come and let your spiritual life get stronger? Would you come and ask God for help? Would you come and be accountable for who you are and what you are? Even now, begin to come. Don't wait, don't wait, don't wait. Assess your life. Get those things out. Deal with the sin. Deal with the issues. Deal with the unforgiveness. Ask the Lord to show you who you need to apologize to. Who do you need to get your life, your relationship straightened back out again with? Who are those people? 
What's the sin that you've hidden from everybody, your husband, your wives, for decades or years? Get it out, confess those things, because those things will hold us back. It might even keep us from heaven. Jesus said, Forgive us, we'll do that. Forgive us, we'll do that. So keep assessing, folks. Keep assessing. Father God, I pray in this place today. Your spirit will manifest itself with presence and with strength. Lord, I pray you right now begin to expose sin, you begin to expose issues, begin to expose conflict. Lord, things that, that, that some of these folks have forgotten about or just kind of put, up, put away, walked away from, hope they forget. Lord, bring those things back so they can deal with them and address them. Holy Spirit, expose our hearts right now, God. Reveal to us the things that need to be forgiven for. Reveal to us the dirt, the filth, the shame. Reveal to us those things that have got to change. Because if they don't, they will keep us from you. Lord, I pray for every man here today that might be struggling with lust and temptation for pornography. I pray, God, you bring them hope and peace, give them transparency and accountability. Lord, for those who serve with gossip and anger and self-control, Lord, help them to get a grip on those things because of your word and because of accountability. Lord, for those who struggle with fear and tension of things in their lives and feel they have no control over stuff, God, you help them to find that. But Lord, there are some that need to forgive parents. There are some parents that need to forgive their kids. There are some brothers and sisters that need to, re need to repent and, and, and apologize to sisters and brothers here. Both in Christ and in the family. God, open our hearts to see what it is you're saying. 